I am so excited to be here with my dear friend, Elena Hertigerhoff, and she's coming back on the show. We just figured out she was in episode seven, uh, and we were sure this was the third time she's on the show, but it's actually her second. So welcome back, Elena. Thank you so much, Sigrun, for having me. I'm absolutely delighted to be here with you for the second time. <laughs> yeah. And it's because you now actually have started a second project that we haven't talked about yet. And uh, you were a guest speaker at my last two live events, uh, Sigrun Live, that we typically have in October in Zurich. And uh, people were a little bit surprised. Why, why is he bringing Elena back as a speaker? I even got like a nasty comment <laughs> from an attendee. Uh, but it was because you had a completely different talk. It's like a completely different business. So we want to dive into that in this episode. Your, I wouldn't say a completely new direction, but additional direction, uh, what you're already doing before. So Elena, you're a serial entrepreneur. So take us back to your first business. Oh my God, my first business, I feel like I was a baby back then in comparison to where I am now. My first business was in Paris and I had set up a career coaching company <laughs> for expats. So this was my very first business and I was 25. So I'm now 42. <laughs> wow. How did you get that idea? Career coaching. Um, actually, I got that I idea because I was working in HR as a headhunter and I realized so many expats came to me and said, how do I do this? How do I get a great job in France as an expat? And I thought, well, I know how to do this. So I just switched sides of the table from headhunter to coach. Um, and that worked really well. So I mm -hmm. had a, a, this was my first business that I just basically created out of a need that I saw. And how long did you do that? I did that, oh, I think almost uh, three and a half, four years. Mm. And what made you switch to another business? Well, um, during that time, I actually uh, co-founded uh, an environmental uh, business as well about, you know, promoting wind energy in France. But that was just a side business at that time. But my big leap uh, actually came into skincare uh, when I, um, I had developed a balm for uh, my skin condition. And um, I decided with a friend of mine to launch that in beautiful Switzerland with you. So I left Paris to, to launch um, my skincare brand. And um, that was a big journey in and of itself as well. That is a, like, a big difference. You know, when you are in the service-based business, you feel like, wow, going into a product-based business is a bit scarier. There's a lot of like upfront, mm. upfront investment involved. Oh, there's a lot of upfront investment involved. There's much higher risk. Mm. Um, and uh, I, I would say, you know, the, the sleepless nights in a product-based business versus a service-based one are double. <laughs> So I'm not sure that I would necessarily personally uh, start another product-based business. Not for the faint of heart, for sure. No. <laughs> <laughs> so you moved to Zurich, Switzerland to yes. uh, run this uh, skincare company with your yes. friend, business partner. Yes. Uh, yes. And you just had one product and you launched with that? Yes, I just launched with one product. And I've always been a fan of doing one thing well and doing it big. It was the same for my skincare brand. It was the same for my TEDx talk. I love doing one big thing and doing that exceptionally well. So most people in the skincare industry told me, you need to launch your product with a range of products. You cannot just go out there with one product. It's never going to work. And I said, it is because I'm interested in something iconic. And if I can launch an iconic product, then after sure, I can launch a range. But I want to first establish myself in this market space um, for one thing that does its job amazingly well. I'm so glad you said it because I constantly give this advice to my clients who are thinking of products or even services. Mm -hmm. Start with one thing and do it really well. Um, so I've seen that very well done with other uh, beauty brands. Yes. Uh, to have like this hit product, your mm -hmm. best seller, start with that and then you add the portfolio. So how long did you do that? I did that for almost five years. 
uh, before I then um, sold this business, moved to Munich, uh, where I'm originally from, um, and then shifted gears after I sold that, shifted back into the service world, uh, back into um, coaching. And so I, I uh, transitioned out of that product world, which for me um, was in a, a world that I learned tremendous amounts about entrepreneurship, uh, running a product-based business. But I have to say it's incredibly challenging also to get it right. Um, and uh, for me, running a day-to-day -day cosmetic business was not my pride and joy. I'm more of a zero to 100 person than 100 to 200. So uh, at some point, I hit my 100 and I knew it was time to move uh, into my next incarnation. Well, that kind of is a description of a serial entrepreneur. They typically don't stick around forever. <laughs> That's true. I'm very loyal in my relationships, but in my businesses, I like to evolve uh, with also my soul calling and what I really feel lights me up at any given moment. Mm. So you started uh, basically uh, business coaching as yes. a, a service-based business. And, Correct. And how long ago was that? Ooh, I, oh, I... That's a great question. I think that's now, how many years ago is that? I think that's now uh, seven years ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. About seven years ago. So then you built up, you know, uh, like one-on-one -on -one coaching, also online courses. Yes, I did the whole online business shebang. Um, and, and, and the reason for that is, is because many people, when I sold my business, they said, wow, you're, you're such a sensitive person. How, how did you manage to become successful being that you are sensitive, you are a very intuitive person. I'm not your standard hustler. How did you do it? How did you do it so well? And I thought, I want to help other sensitive entrepreneurs uh, succeed. And so that's why I moved into business coaching. And yes, one-to-one uh, -one masterminds, online courses, group everything. coaching, the whole group thing, coaching, the whole thing, the whole ascension um, model. <laughs> I, I, yeah, exactly. The whole thing. And, um, I love doing that because I love entrepreneurship. It's, it's one of the things I'm still passionate about. So that definitely has not changed. <laughs> I'm still very passionate about entrepreneurship and helping others thrive because I think entrepreneurship is an exceptional way for us to share our gifts with the world. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I did that. And within that context of showing sensitive entrepreneurs that they are here to make a difference, um, I did my TEDx talk, which was kind of my next big thing and my next big bang <laughs> in my business. Yeah, I think... You know, a lot of people do a TEDx talk and it doesn't really change their lives, I would say. I would say it has some impact. It's good PR uh, and potentially has, uh, you know, also a revenue impact on their business. But in your case, it completely pivoted you again. Yes, it totally did pivot me again. Um, because this, this TEDx talk went viral because I think it touched so many people in a, in a very deep and profound way. So at, at the moment of recording, we're now at 2.6 million views, which is still like incredible. Wow, congratulations. That's amazing. 2.6 million. Yeah. And, and, you know, still to this day, every day I get emails from people that share their life stories with me. And I'm so grateful because I've never felt more connected to people all over the world. And when I saw uh, what a great TED Talk can do in, in terms of a talk can literally reach millions of people. It can impact world consciousness in a positive way. I thought, I know how to do this. I want to help other entrepreneurs. And of course, again, entrepreneurs, but I wanted to help other entrepreneurs also impact the world with their knowing, their power, their gifts through a TEDx talk. So that's how I um, created my Red Dot Stage business to, to help um, great people do great talks. <laughs> yes. But I remember because we typically meet once a year to mastermind in person. Yes. Uh, and there was a little wiggle there before you shifted completely to the TEDx business because I remember the success of your talk and we masterminded, what can you do with this? Mm -hmm. And the question was, can you serve like even more highly sensitive people, like on a bigger scale than through your business coaching. Yes. Um, that didn't go so well. 
No, <laughs> that was very interesting for me because um, I, I had a thought that, you know, maybe a part of what I should do is, is uh, again, part of our big online, online training is to run a membership site. And I thought this was something that would, would work for me. And it's very interesting that it didn't. Um, and it didn't work most of all for my energy. So that was an interesting insight for me that I am not, uh, you know, like people say, you know, you're the lighthouse, you work for everyone. This is actually not my path. And I had a rude awakening about that, that this is not meant for me. So I do best in smaller environments, um, whether it's smaller groups, masterminds, one-on-one -on -one coaching, rather than to launch something, quote unquote, more uh, uh, open mass kind of product. Um, this wasn't right for me. Um, and I had to uh, uh, humbly take that lesson and recognize, okay, uh, this, is, this is not my thing. I should concentrate on what I do best. And what I realized, what I do best is actually work with other leaders in an in a equal sharing capacity um, and help them step into their greatness so that's what i realized from that experience and i'm so grateful i tried it yes. because otherwise i would have been like oh maybe i should do this and maybe this is part of how i'm meant to serve and i realized it's not so i made no. my peace with that <laughs> and i'm glad you share it because you know uh, often we're talking about like, oh, this person started this business and then they did that. And people think, wow, everything was just dance and roses and, mm -hmm. and there were no mistakes or failures on the way. But oh God, no, of no course I, I'm so glad you talk about <laughs> failures because I want to fully normalize failures as part of the entrepreneurial process. You know, there is no such things as rainbows and unicorns all day. <laughs> <laughs> so. No, I think it's important. Of course, we're trying to uh, summarize your background before we get to the juicy topic of the episode. So <laughs> we're not going to talk about every little thing, but I, I, I wanted to mention this part about the membership site. Yeah. Uh, but I also, there's one thing that I've noticed being friends for so many years now. Uh, yes. is that, you know, you, your talk is about highly sensitivity and you describe yourself openly as an HSP. Yeah. Um, I feel there are a lot of people that use that as an excuse not to take action or have the feeling that they cannot build a successful business. What, what you know, are the different types of HSPs or, or can you explain why one person would use this as an excuse and others say, this is my power? Yes, I think it's like with every label, you can use it to your advantage or disadvantage, depending on if in life you're, you, you're looking for an excuse to where you are, or you're looking for a springboard to where you want to go. And I think it's, it's really a, a mindset that will determine that. Uh, so being a highly sensitive person is in and of itself a neutral state of affairs. It's a genetic trait. You can't choose it. So it's not like you can opt in or opt out of that personality trait. But what you can do is look towards the gifts of that trait and see how you can use these gifts to make your life and the world a better place. Or you can look at the shadow sides of that and say, oh, because I'm sensitive, I can't do this or I can't do that or I'm overwhelmed by this. So it's really your choice if you look on the sunny or the shadowy side of that trait. And I've just uh, made it my mission to empower people to look uh, at the sunny side because there is more than enough good stuff of being highly sensitive and more than enough that you can use to your advantage uh, for entrepreneurship. Yeah. Well, I'm glad we talked about that. <laughs> <laughs> so you pivoted over to your TEDx business. So basically you closed the business coaching business yes, completely. I and I did. Was that hard? Um, it was hard because I think, uh, and I mean, I've done this several times now, so I, sh I should be used to this. <laughs> You're you know, used to this, yeah. Selling businesses or closing businesses to pivot. Um, but yes, there's always a melancholy of, of something when you close something you love because I didn't close it because it didn't work and I didn't close it because I didn't love it anymore. 
I closed it because I had a bigger calling in a different direction. So of course, you know, that mitigates some of that, you know, sadness that you feel when you move into a new chapter, but like every great chapter that you read, you know, you're like, wow, that was awesome. I wish I could continue reading it, but you know, to move forward, you need to let go. And for me, it's always a practice of relearning how to let go each time and trust that I'm onto a new path and a path that's right for me. Mm. That's so true. So true. So that took quite, you know, I think when you start completely fresh and you say, now I want to help people give a TEDx talk. And I know you were aiming for more successful entrepreneurs and leaders that have done some great work already. And sometimes I have clients in front of me and I said, Sigrun, how do I go for that type of audience if nobody knows me? Like how, how did you do that? Yeah. So that was an interesting um, shift because you're right. You know, my business coach business, um, I, I was of course more advanced in where I was so I could reach back and help my business coaching clients uh, take them to the next level. And for that here, I was speaking to my peers. So this is a total uh, transition. Um, and I thought I have to be ingenious about talking to my peers because my peers are not going to sit there and watch a webinar necessarily. They're not going to react to, uh, you know, the typical online funnel. I have to uh, come up with something different. So I actually came up with a, an approach to personally uh, reach out, uh, in this case, uh, my wonderful assistant, uh, to have her reach out to people that I pre-select with her together and see who would be a right match, who already has a level of expertise that would work for the TEDx stage. And I should tell them about our services and invite them uh, to connect with us. And this uh, very old school way of doing business um, has worked very well for me. And um, I said goodbye to a lot of the, the big fancy mechanics of my online business to do that. <laughs> yeah, the webinars and Facebook lives and all that stuff was not needed anymore for this mm -mm. higher end business. So uh, does this involve LinkedIn or is it really just email? Just email. Yeah. Fascinating. I love that. Yeah, I don't do email marketing. I don't do Facebook ads. I don't do webinars. I don't do 90% of the things I used to do. <laughs> yeah. And how does that feel? That feels incredibly light um, because it just, you know, it just goes to show you that you can run a very successful business with a very simple strategy and uh, you don't need a lot of fancy fireworks to get a fireworks result. Uh, and I think that's uh, yeah. sometimes we underestimate that we can have it easy and have it work great. Yeah. So basically the business is built on you reach out to people that you've seen them doing some great things yeah. and you tell them about the service. And since obviously a lot of people want to give a TEDx talk, it, yes. you already have this carrot you know correct that they have possibly been thinking about and now someone comes along and you have the credibility of your own talk and now you've also had you know lots of success with your clients yes. so it's kind of like almost like a no-brainer it doesn't feel it's not the same way as if i would reach out and trying to sell someone business coaching no you, that's absolutely right and i think the reason uh why this works so well for me is because it's very niche and at the same time, I'm tapping into an existing need that's already there before we come along. So I don't need to create a need. The need is there. Uh, and I have a direct solution for that need. And I have a high level of expertise that I can easily prove and that even people can prove by themselves if they want. They can check it online. They can look at my talk right away, see this is legit. Mm -hmm. uh, so I break down a lot of the barriers of a cold contact is they see this is legit. They can check it. It's there. Um, mm -hmm. And so a high level of trust is built right away. Yeah. So you are pivoting again, maybe not completely, but you're tapping your toes into a new direction. So how did that come about? You already have a successful seven figure, you know, uh, let's say speaker coaching business running really well, really no reason to change, but sometimes we yes. just have a calling. <laughs> so, so it's interesting you say that because for me, it, it feels not so much like a pivot as it feels like an expansion uh, in this case, because uh, my TEDx business 
is my main squeeze. It's my main love. Your and bread and my butter. Main, my, my, this is my, absolutely, it's my, my bread and butter. And I love doing that. And for me, the, my main driver behind this is uh, to expand world consciousness through people sharing their gifts. And I felt that it was also time for me to also do what I know how to do for myself, which is uh, share some of my messages as well particularly when it comes to sharing consciousness work. Um, and so I thought, you know, I help wonderful people share wonderful messages and I mustn't forget that I too still have messages to share. Um, and so it's, it's an addition to that, uh, which birthed uh, my, my newest incarnation, which is to help leaders step into the frequency of love consciousness. Um, and that's something that I think has been a guiding feature of uh, probably every business I've done is, is, to, is to share it from an energy of love. And um, I feel really strongly called um, to share that message with other fellow business owners and leaders. So you're not really thinking of closing down your TEDx business. Oh, oh no. Oh no. <laughs> oh no. No. So we'll, no, no, we'll make no. that we'll make that very clear. She's not closing down her business. No, definitely not. But it's more like 20% of your time or whatever 10% of your time that you want to follow that calling and put your message out. Like like your maybe you need need another TEDx talk. Ah, I think actually you you're right about that and I will do another TEDx talk on this is already on my on my list and um this what i'm doing here with love consciousness that is that is uh probably 10 percent of my time 90 percent is red dot stage mm -hmm. and this 10 percent though is it's like for me you know it's it's different it has a different energy because mm -hmm. it's it's what my soul wants to say and 90 percent is helping other people say what they should say so it's a beautiful marriage between uh Two, two different ways of expressing the same wish, which is to help shift global consciousness to a different frequency. So for some people, that sounds a bit woo-woo. I'm included. <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny that Elena and I are dear friends, but uh, she uh, <laughs> takes care of the woo, -woo side for us. <laughs> uh, so you need to explain, especially to people like myself, what is love consciousness? Yeah, and, and you know, I have to say, Sigrun, I, I love you dearly. And I am so pleased that, you know, we can we can be such close friends, even though I'm probably closer to the unicorn world than you are. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I, I'd love to explain what I believe love consciousness is. So for me, generally, consciousness is an awareness um, of the multidimensionality of our being. It's an awareness that everything is energy and that everything is connected to each other. And as, as a humanity, we have a consciousness as humanity where we all contribute kind of our energy, our frequency to that. And right now the dominant uh, frequency on this planet, the dominant consciousness is fear. And I think for us to move uh, into our next level, as human beings, it's to shift that lens uh, from fear to love. Because I think love is truly the only frequency that has the answers that we're looking for. And um, I love this quote by Einstein, who said, we cannot solve the problems we created on the same, uh, uh, we cannot solve the problems in our world uh, from the same level of consciousness that created them. So for me, you know, mindset work is not going to get us there just you know shifting our thoughts is not going to get us there we need to really shift our being uh to get us there um and i think consciousness is kind of like mindset 2.0 it is moving us from our um doing into our being and if we take love as our lens um then we can shift into a place of trust of intuition of surrender of the heart energy of kindness, of joy. And I think uh, truly that for me is love consciousness. A love consciousness has um, many of the answers we're looking for. I think some world leaders need some of that. Ah, this would be my <laughs> dream, yes. And I, <laughs> I believe that, absolutely. <laughs> can we 
Do you feel that we as a, I mean, general public, if, 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 if that consciousness gets shifted, that it impacts those silly people that are in charge of some countries? Yes, because if, if enough people have a mass shift in vibration, then that will impact everyone. It elevates everyone. So like a rising tide lifts all boats, rising consciousness lifts everyone. So uh, it's, it's our individual jobs to work on ourselves first. And then uh, when we have done that directly and indirectly, do we impact world consciousness? I always say this, you have to put the oxygen mask first on yourself and then the child, you know, they say this on the plane, I didn't invent it, but I, I say this is also about building your business. And I would think this is the same about, you know, love consciousness or just generally be kinder. Like maybe we start with ourselves. Yes, that's exactly right. We start with ourselves and um, that might sound quote unquote selfish, but really what I mean when I say you start with yourself is you start by accessing your own self-love because I think to radiate an energy of love consciousness, you need to radiate from a place of inner wholeness. And the way to get to a place of inner wholeness is to love yourself. And you know, the funny thing is when you ask most people, you know, who do you love in your life? Uh, people say, oh, my partner, my parents, my kids, whoever nobody almost nobody would say themselves and that's a great shame because truly we are here to to assume and be and radiate the energy of love so you fundamentally have to love yourself first and foremost before you even look at loving others mm. so there are certain steps that a person can go through to reach that level of consciousness that you're talking about so the first place is be kinder to yourself or what's the first place to start um i think the first place to start is to acknowledge to yourself that you have love inside of you that is meant for you to enjoy and that starts with acknowledging that you are enough you are good enough you are worthy enough you are meant to be here you wouldn't be here if there wasn't a purpose for your existence and really internalize that because there is so much talk about inside our own heads about i'm not good enough i'm not fast enough i'm not quick enough i i can't learn fast enough i don't make enough money i don't have enough clients it's it's all about this not enoughness and the remedy for that is to step into your deep enoughness on a soul level and really um, acknowledge that and to have a daily practice almost to access that. So most people that I talk to, they're like, I don't know how to do that. I don't know how to love myself. Like, where do I even begin? Mm -hmm. And that's a very, uh, you know, interesting question because where do you begin if you don't know how to do that? So my idea for that is to circumvent that question and ask a different question. And that question is, if I really loved myself, what would I be doing today? So you, you almost put yourself outside of yourself to look at what's possible for you. And then you look at the habits of your daily life when it comes to your health, your relationships, your lifestyle, your business, your spiritual experience, if you really loved yourself, what would you be doing? How would you start your morning? Uh, what would you eat? Who would you call? What kind of clients would you take on? Um, you know, you quickly understand like, wow, there are so many things that you may be currently doing that you don't love and that don't make you feel good and yet you're doing them. So these are all the ways where if you ask that question, you quickly understand what loving yourself would look like and then you yeah. can start to take some action steps. Mm. makes me think of my daily walk <laughs> yeah that's exactly that's a loving act for yourself or you know I, I make myself a fresh juice every morning and I'm, I'm definitely not a morning person but I learned that if I do that I feel good so I integrate that and it can be something tiny like that uh, or a walk or you know calling somebody you love every day or whatever it is to align yourself with that frequency of I love myself I'm good enough so what we've done that, if I really make sure that I do that at least a few things a day and I yes. feel closer to that, what's the next step? So the next step for me would be to actually tap into your body. 
in the wisdom of our bodies. So uh, most entrepreneurs, myself included, we uh, run the majority of our business from our head. And it's about shifting from your head to your heart and shifting really from um, that, that frequency of uh, thinking about your problems and pushing through and controlling and, and acting out to moving into your intuition, to moving into your alignment, to moving into your flow. And your body can be an amazing guide for you to see where you're going right or wrong in your life and in your business. Because your body has an instinctive reaction to almost everything. If you take the time to listen. For example, if you wanted to hire somebody new for your team, you know, you could look at the CV, you could be like, awesome, this person has everything I need. But you have that funny feeling in your belly. Like, why is that? Well, your belly kind of knows something that your mind doesn't want to know or doesn't acknowledge but if you if you were to tap into your body and then the feelings you get around people around products around services you want to launch around decisions your body has an answer you just need to listen to it and um i once did something funny i went on an ayurvedic um a panchakarma cure uh, quite a few years ago and the doctor there said to me he said you know the problem with most westerners is that you treat your brain like a ferrari and your body like a bicycle and i thought to myself wow that's so true like for me my body is a bicycle that's that's an underdeveloped connection for me i am i have a super developed mind but i don't take the time to acknowledge the wisdom of my body and so i make a point now to extend that love energy into my body and uh, listen to the cues um, I get. And the more you do that, the more you tap into a frequency of a higher energy source, which doesn't loop through your brain, it loops through your heart, through your intuition, um, and that produces phenomenal results. So most of the time, and I know Sigrun probably for you too, when I make decisions like from that gut-based place, from that body feeling place, I'm almost always right on the money. Yeah. Well, I use definitely my intuition to take decisions or I call it gut feeling. Mm -hmm. So I'm excited about the next step then. Yes. And the next step is you actually want to look at maybe now that we looked at more the personal side, the business side. So a great thing to do is to check how aligned is your business with the frequency of love how aligned is everything that you do and i invite you to even though we're not quite in spring as at the time of recording to really do kind of a, a love energy spring clean and look at um, how your business feels to you again not to think about it but to feel into it so does something feel for example dark or bright to you energetically so you can for example look at the people that work for you, your team, how do they feel to you, your clients, how do they feel, your product services, is something no longer in alignment, um, maybe the regular tasks you do on a daily basis, which ones are actually no longer feeling good to you, so when you get a bad feeling or a good feeling or a dark or a bright energy, however you read energy, take maybe a CEO day for yourself and, and do a love alignment check to see what really feels right and what feels wrong for you. And then you will have um, an incredible roadmap of where you're heading in your business. Um, and you can understand um, that perhaps you're operating your business more from fear uh, than you think you are um, and that there may be things to shift, let go of, surrender and bring in um, energies that feel much more aligned. So that, that is um, a key thing to do. And then um, another thing that I think um, could use a love consciousness overhaul for many of us is to look at our uh, client attraction and our marketing. So when it comes to client attraction and marketing, there too, I think we can start to operate from a different frequency. So a lot of the time, and Sigrun, you work with so many people as well and entrepreneurs, um, you know this like I do, is that a lot of client attraction comes from a place of lack and a place of fear. And they're not enough clients. Where are my clients? I can't get clients. My Facebook ads are not working. Yeah, you know, it's like this whole thing. Um, and 
what I would invite people to do is before they look at the strategies is to look at themselves because we are an extension of our business. Um, and our business is an extension of us. So it's a, a it's an osmotic uh, relationship. So if something in your business is not working from an attraction point of view, like you don't get the clients you want, you don't get the money you want, look at yourself and see, are you truly in a frequency of love or are you in a frequency of fear? And you magnetize clients through love. You magnetize them because they can sense that you're in it for them and not in it for you. And that's a huge huge shift and if you release this this need to control who works with you when they're going to come how they're going to come and you surrender yourself truly to a heart space and you you release that need to have something happen a certain way then things truly align for you and i think even you know if you're in direct sales and you get on calls with people and you have sales calls you know, don't go in there thinking that your next client is your meal ticket. Look at this as a human being that you have an opportunity to serve and you truly see how do you feel about this person? Do you truly feel aligned? Do, do they inspire a feeling of love in you? And likewise, allow them to do the same and just connect with them on an energetic level, on a positive level and, and be free of any attachment for results. So that's the one thing I would say is really helpful to shift into that frequency. And the other one is when it comes to our marketing, uh, so our outward facing uh, marketing. So um, a lot of marketing comes uh, off to me with the wrong vibe. And by that, I mean, most marketing is uh, pain based right? We, we point out people's problems, we point out their pains. And I think, you know, there's, there's to some extent, you know, it's, it's okay to share with your clients, you know, that you can understand where they are and you can understand where they're coming from, but you must make sure that your sales pages are not just, uh, you know, speckled with pain points all over the place without actually giving also enough room for a sense of possibility because just selling to people because you successfully made them feel bad and you made them feel like you are the only solution to their problem, I think is, is not right because it attracts the wrong customers. It attracts the wrong energy to your business. You really don't want that. And so I would say, you know, give your business a love marketing overhaul. Um, instead of just focusing on pain points, focus on possibilities, focus on people's dreams and desires and really uh, shift your attraction point from pain to pleasure almost. And, you know, there's uh, Mother Teresa, I think, said once she would never uh, go to an anti-war rally. She would only go to a peace rally. And I think we can apply that lens to our business. Uh, don't be anti-war uh, or negative in your approach. Try and, and um, try and do something positive. Uh, and I think that shift alone has done so much for me. So I intend to always infuse whatever I put out there with that um, frequency now. Yeah, that's an interesting one because uh, when you spoke at uh, my life event uh, last year, this, uh, this part of the steps was left people a bit thinking, yes, I have to stop talking about problems. And I was like, you know, because you, you teach people to be, you know, you, people have to be aware that they have a problem. Yes. If they're going to do something about it. So yes. let's say you're a weight loss coach. Now yes. the person wants to lose weight. They feel maybe bad about putting on weight, uh, but they would like to be slim or fit or whatever, or learn to love themselves. However you want to phrase it. Yes. Uh, if people are not aware there's anything wrong, mm -hmm. there is no reason to buy. There's no reason to even go on a daily walk or, or do fitness or start to drinking juice in the morning. A lot of people will not make a change until there is pain. Yes. Uh, so I think it's important to say here that, Elena, you're not meaning that you stop using those. No, words. no, not at all. I think, I think uh, where people may be trip up when I say that is they think that means you shouldn't talk about um, the problems your client has. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that, yes, 
you show them your awareness of where they're at. That's really important because they need to feel heard. They need to feel you know what they're going through because you do, clearly, if you're coaching them on that. You need to point out, you know, if they stay there, that this obviously will have some kind of uh, consequence for them, whether that's weight loss, business coaching, or whatever it is. But I'm saying from an energetic point of view, thereafter, when you, when you have reeled them in and they understand that, then make sure you don't drive home guilt, scarcity, fear, because I think that is destructive on an energetic level to everyone involved, including you as a business owner. Move them from there into a sense of possibility. Move them into what's uh, out there for them. Move them into their, their, their pleasure of their future and their desires. And I think that um, how you write that, how you are in service, there makes a huge difference. It's, it's, it's about nuances here. And are you truly coming from trying to scare somebody into buying from you? Or are you trying to get them excited to buy from you? So this is a big shift for me. Yeah, I think that's important to just hone in a little bit because people might misunderstand. And uh, if you're teaching someone how to write copy or how to create sales pages, and then Elena comes along and says, <laughs> oh, it's all about love. And, and they're like, Sigrun, what you said is wrong. I think. Uh, the way what Elena means and how I understand it, it's the overall feelings yes. of yes, your absolutely. message and your whatever Facebook ad or sales page. It's the overall feeling. You still have to talk about problems uh, because otherwise, as I said, people will not buy or do yes. anything or change their lives. Um, but I want to go back a little bit when you said, does something feel heavy in your business? Because I want to share an example where I felt very heavy mm -hmm. in my business. I had a Facebook group with 11,000 people. And it's a little bit was like, do I close it down? Do I continue using it? And I went back and forth for months. And every time I came to the group, it felt heavy. Um, so I hadn't heard Elena talk on stage. Actually, before you spoke on stage about this, I had actually decided to close down the group. I kept it open, though, uh, around that time because we were going into a launch, and I thought to myself, I'll go live a few times in that old group, but I'll start a new group. But in the middle of the launch, I had started a new group, and only, I don't know, 2,000 people were in the new group, and I thought to myself, did I do a mistake? But no, the energy, mm -hmm. it was not about the number of people. And I think there's a lot of scarcity, mm -hmm. you know, deleting people from your email list or, or you know, uh, closing down a Facebook group or, or closing down a business, like you said before. Mm -hmm. But if it feels heavy, it feels heavy and then you have to do something about it. Yeah. That's so, that's so great that you share that because that's exactly what I mean. You know these things and strategically, a lot of these things make no sense because you're like, oh, my big Facebook group could be awesome for my launch, blah, 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 you know. But if the energy is off, the energy is off. You have to honor that and have to trust that whatever comes after that will serve you better and, and in a different way because otherwise the energy wouldn't feel heavy to you if it, if it weren't right for you to let it go. Yeah. So, are there more steps to the process? <laughs> well, there are, of course, always more steps to the process. But I think, um, you know, as an as a overall guiding feature, if you just try and uh, filter your life and your business through a lens of love, I think then you're already uh, well on your way to shifting things. Um, and I think that is, that is always a beautiful daily reminder is, um, how can I come from an energy of love to the people I meet, to the clients I serve, to myself, to my body, to my partner, to my family, to my kids, to whoever, is to ask yourself that. And uh, love always has a wiser answer. So whatever love answers to your question is probably the way to go. Um, and and that's, that's it for me. It's not a hugely complicated thing. It's really tapping into that frequency that is ever present for us. And it's just reminding ourselves that we can look at every problem from a higher plane of consciousness and then see what the answers are that we get from that plane. Hmm. So now this is an expansion of your previous business. 
does it mean that you work with clients or how, how does that work for you? Is it more about putting out your mission? Like, obviously I'm seeing a TEDx talk. I see. There will be a TEDx talk. Yes, there will be a TEDx talk about, um, uh, uh, leadership and love and how the two work together. So yes, a TEDx talk is absolutely in the works uh, for that. We didn't talk about this. So it's funny you, you say that because yes, it's absolutely. I'm just seeing it. It makes so obvious because yes. that's your other business and uh, a book about this. Yes, there will be a book. And, um, I have decided to, um, actually channel that book and that might sound funny from an entrepreneur like me that I would say that but that is um, how I do things I um, I would say most of the time I'm just a conduit for information that is not of me but that flows through me and I know that I want to write a book about love consciousness and uh, love leadership and so I I am going to now actually start a very small group program where I am going to teach my 12 fundamental love leadership lessons. Um, and after that also have, of course, a coaching segment, but the, that part, the training part, I will convert into a book. Uh, I'll have those uh, lessons transcribed and they will become a book. And of course, not the coaching segments. Those are just for the participants so that we can um, dive into those individual topics deeper. But this will be how I write my book. I'm not somebody who can sit there and, you know, lock myself into a chalet in the mountains and have a book a month later. I need the energy of other people to pull out my best knowledge and um, to, to let it flow through me. So uh, in a group environment, I will write my book and at the same time, um, train and work with uh, other love leaders that are ready for that next level of expansion in their business. I love it. And I think that's such a unique way to birth a book. Uh, <laughs> if you have been following my, my, me for a while, you know that I always want to write a book and I never get to it. So maybe your recipe might work for me too, Helen. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think, I think there is something to be said because if you, if you have a scheduled meeting with your clients, you know, we do that for our online courses. I've created many. So have you, um, you know, we know how to create content, but I think a book is kind of a, almost like a sacred work and sometimes having people in front of you that you almost have your first readers live in front of you um, helps you to to commit to it and also filter out um, your your highest wisdom so I'm very excited about launching that yes I'm excited for you and thank you for sharing with me and my audience uh, your love consciousness now of course people would like to know where to find you how can they figure out more about Elena and her love consciousness? Yes. So uh, I made it super easy for everyone with my very long last name. You can find out more on elenaherdickerhoff.com um, where you find more about me, my story and, and my offerings, of course. But uh, for those of you that are not going to trip over the spelling of my name, you can also um, join me uh, at loveleaders.club and in this case forward slash webinar because I am um, putting together a, a webinar to teach people more about love consciousness. It's a free webinar so you can go to loveleaders.club forward slash webinar to find out more uh, specifically about entrepreneurship and love consciousness if you're interested. Fantastic. We'll link this all up in the show notes so you can also just click over there and click on the link to join Elena. Elena, thank you for coming on the show. I loved, we could have spoken forever. <laughs> That's so true. <laughs> it, it's interesting. A conversation is different when you know someone closely. And I think uh, those who have listened or watched, they can see that uh, there's a lot of love between us. So. Yes, I think our love consciousness <laughs> is between each other. It's <laughs> really alive and well and um sending my love to all of our listeners as well thank you so much Sigrun for having me and thank you everyone for tuning in I hope uh, it served everyone who joined us today thank you so much Helena thank you lots of love bye <laughs>